Let's, uh, am I on? Good deal. Let's take our Bibles and let's go to what you see up there on the screen, Matthew 12. And uh, we'll, we'll run into a few other places this morning. It's good. I'm glad you guys decided to come out today. <clears throat> I, I am used to talking to a camera and a microphone with no one there. And uh, there's been times when I have, and I won't tell anybody which ones, but there's been times when I've come out here and recorded teachings, and it was like I was talking to people in the room, and there's nobody in the room. And I'm even going, Amen? And I guess people just pretend in their mind that they hear amen. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I have buttons. Trust me. I have buttons that I can put in amens and applauses and other sound effects. So anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 12, we're studying spirits. And we're just kind of moving through a list in the Bible of how the Bible names certain spirits, and in this case, we're studying unclean spirits. Um, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, I'll read the text, and then I'll ask you some questions, all right? Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. This is Jesus teaching, and he says, When the unclean spirit, I want you to think about what that means, Okay? An unclean spirit is a dirty spirit. It's unclean. It's defiled. It is the opposite of the Holy Spirit. All right? It is the exact opposite of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a clean spirit. When God saves us, He washes us. He cleans us. He cleanses us. We have sin. Uh, think of sin as, as defilement. Think of sin as like di different diseases like leprosy in the Bible and so on. And um, so that is when a person had leprosy, they had, according to the law, they had to, there were certain requirements that they had to do. And one of them was if they, if they came into town, they had to announce to everybody that they were unclean. They had to walk through saying unclean, unclean, unclean. And, and what that was, God was, God was using that because God is the one who put leprosy on this earth and it's a bacteria and uh, hard, to, hard to get rid of. And it's transmitted by contact. And so nobody can touch this person or they'll end up with leprosy. And um, so that's why they had to do that. And even if someone was healed of leprosy or someone was, uh, the leprosy had, had sort of dried up in them, then they could go through a process whereby they were clean. Uh, Jesus healed lepers he cleansed the lepers he can heal diseases and he can heal the disease of sin so behind think of it this way behind dirty sins is an unclean spirit have you ever had somebody do something to you and you said well they did me dirty you ever heard something like that that's, that's a phrase we use okay it means they did something wrong to you and it, it's an unclean spirit behind that. Or when someone, and we talked about this last Sunday, when that rock and roll song, Dirty Deeds Done Cheap, okay? That's an unclean spirit. So he says here in verse uh, <clears throat> 43, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. And then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, notice this, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished swept means that it was clean it was cleansed from whatever that spirit did okay uh who in here has at least one area of your life and and i'm thinking like you got a closet or your car or your shed or anything like that that you don't clean it as much as other places Your room, your teeth, your socks, your desk, the kitchen, your seat in the car. What else? 
Anything else? Okay. Mine is usually, my desk gets cluttered very easily. And every now and then, I got to stop and I got to go, I got to clean this up. I mean, I can, I tolerate it, but then I've had enough of it and I got to get this cleaned up. Okay. There is something in me that wants things to be clean. Uh, I try to be pretty clean about my body. I I'm, I'm take a shower every day, sometimes twice a day, depending on what I've done outside. But I like to have clean hair when I go about the day. I like to have a clean face. I like to have a clean body. I like to have clean teeth. Amen. I like to have clean face. Just kind of clean. Got to clean my nose every now and then. Just like to clean up. There's something in us that wants to clean up. There are some people, there is nothing clean in their life. And I'm referring to, as far as the outside is concerned, they have a very dirty house, they have a very dirty car, the way that they keep themselves, they have dirty hair, they have dirty teeth, they have dirty, they don't, they don't bathe very much, things like that. Um, you can say what you want to, but in practically any place in the world, that's repulsive. It's not desirable. That's not, there is no magazine, Better Trash and Sewer. Okay, there is no magazine named that. There's Better Homes and Gardens. And when they take pictures of people's houses, it's always clean. All right. That is something that we desire in our life is to have things in order and to have things clean. Amen. When you garden, you want a clean garden. Gardens can get cluttered up by weeds, by undesirable things, and it takes effort on our part to work that garden, to keep that garden in order, to keep it clean. A dirty garden, a, an unkept garden, is going to be a no good garden. You're not going to get anything out of that garden. You keep that garden nice and clean, you're going to produce fruit in your life. Amen? So it is in our nature to desire to have clean things, to have a clean life, to have a clean mind. And after you're saved and the Holy Ghost begins to deal with you, all of a sudden you don't want dirty things in your eyes. Amen? I used to love, when I was young, I used to love horror movies, monster movies, and things like that. Boy, I used to just really get into that stuff. And after a while, you, you, you know, growing up and maturing and you start getting to where you just, you just don't want that stuff anymore. Don't, don't want to sit down and watch Freddy Krueger mutilate a bunch of people. You don't want to watch a bunch of stuff like that anymore. You want clean things in your life. Amen? Okay. What happens to a pig when you wash a pig? Go right back to it again. Okay. And I want you to remember that. So here's, here's the unclean spirit. He leaves, finds, he ends up in a dry place, wants his house back, he comes back, he finds the house swept and garnished, but then what he does after that is, verse 45, then goeth he and taketh with him himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now I want you to think of that deal where he said it had seven spirits brought back. Who remembers Mary Magdalene? Anybody? Who remembers Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene was saved from what situation in life? What was she saved from? The Bible says... Who's going to say something? The Bible says she had seven devils. And Jesus cast those seven devils out of her. Okay? From what we see in the Bible of Mary Magdalene's testimony, did she ever turn back to what she used to be? No, we see her at the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. That's where she is. She's seeking and she, she, God allowed her to be one of the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And from what we can, from what, and the Bible doesn't say anything more about her, so there is the assumption that she just continued on in that way. Once she sees the risen Christ, she doesn't want to go back to the way things used to be. God just, just sanctified her and just uh, confirmed in her the Holy Spirit of God in her. Okay? So she is a, she is a type of a, of a Christian, the type of a person who, when God delivers them, they, they, they get this, they see the risen Christ. Christ is resurrected. We have not seen the tomb that Christ was risen from. We didn't see the angel sitting on top of that stone. We didn't see anything like that, but in our Bible, and yet we believe it, and we accept that, and we say to ourselves, this is how it is, and this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life. You can, you can run at me any kind of other teaching, any kind of other doctrine. You can throw sin in my way, but I'm telling you that I'm following the risen Savior for the rest of my life. Who can say amen to that? All right. But there's always some people, and pastors sometimes just get a little, they get a little nudge in them. Pastor, watch that person. Watch that guy. Watch that gal. Because some of the struggles there, it just seems like they offloaded a bunch of sins that made them feel good for a while. But sometimes they turn back. Go to uh, Deuteronomy 7. Go to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. And the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee. Look at here. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Now think about this. In your life, there's one thing that is greater and mightier than you are. It's your sin. It's mightier than your flesh. It has, it has power over you. And as a saved person, you don't like it. And so God says, I'm going to put you in that land. And there's going to be seven nations. They're already there. And they're stronger and mightier than you. And God says, now don't fear. Because I can drive them out from before you and cast them aside. So that when you walk into that land, it's free and clear and you don't have anything to worry about. Okay? But we know from when we go to um, turn to Judges chapter 3. After the book of Joshua, that in the book of Judges, when they got to that land. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, as many as of them of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. So what happened was they got into the land, but they did not remove all seven nations. They did not remove the inhabitants of that land. They left some of them there. And God, that was in God's plan. God said, okay, since you left them here, I've actually left them here. I'm not going to drive them out before you. I'm going to teach you how to fight. I'm going to teach you how to know, do warfare. Think of that garden that we brought up a while ago. We want our garden all nice and neat. We want all the rows and, and straight rows. We want, um, uh, you know, we want the fruit to come out. We want, you know, all the little furrows and the air areas. We want them free from... Uh, from um, from weeds and from thorns and thistles and everything else. But that takes effort. It takes a warfare. We take a, a hoe, a plow, and we plow them things up and get those out because they're going to choke out that fruit and it's not going to work. Okay, God teaches us this lesson here. Everybody sitting here, everybody listening to me online, They've got nations that are stronger and mightier than them that they have to deal with issues that they don't like. People call me all week. They call me and they tell me things that are going on in their life. They, they confide in me secret things that nobody else knows about them. They tell me things. And 
I listen to them and what I hear from them is the same thing that I know about my life and about everybody else. Is that there's things that we deal with, things that we're going to have to war against, things that we're going to have to fight, things that we're going to have to deal with. Things that if we are willing, God will aid us and He will help us. But what happens is sometimes people just aren't willing. They don't care. They don't really want to live the life that God has called us to live. So go to, um, go to 1 Peter, I think it is. 1 Peter. Remember that, Sal? What happens to that pig when you wash him? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. This is a teaching on false teachers and false prophets. And it ends up by saying in verse 19, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. Let me, let me throw something at you this morning that I heard this morning on the news. It's what brought it to mind. We're going to enter into a time in the very, very near future. Let's say five years. Okay? Where... Medical science is going to start making promises to people. Promises that they can eliminate diseases, certain diseases, like cancer, like Alzheimer's, like muscular dystrophy. Um, they can eliminate those diseases. If you have them, they can cure them or if there is something genetically in you that you are predisposed to have them, they can cure them before they ever show up. They're going to start making promises to people to give them liberty from diseases. And it's going to be by way of genetic manipulation. I heard something on news this morning. They, you know, they, the news will tease you with stories that they're going to tell in the next 30 minutes. So you've got to watch... 30 minutes worth of commercials to get to this one story. And so I heard a teaser this morning that, how many of you love chocolate? Oh, there's, there's going to be a shortage now of chocolate. Be watching for this now. It's coming up. So when I got to the story part, they said, unusually warm weather because of global warming, which is a lie. Amen. There has been no global warming so far this year. Zero. Okay? Um, cities in the United States breaking records for how long it's been below freezing. Okay, we, this you have to go, in the St. Louis area, you have to go all back to the 70s, they said, for a t period of time longer than what we've just gone through for a time of below freezing. Okay, which is good. That kills all them little bugs and stuff in the ground. Them little worms eat your garden up. That'll kill them off. And that's good, you know, for us. But they said that the w unusually warm climate, it stifles the growth of the cocoa bean that they use to make chocolate from. And so some institute has partnered with the Mars Candy Bar Company and they're going to genetically manipulate cocoa beans so that they can endure the warmer climates that they're growing in right now. And I just shook my head and I'm going, this is man playing God. This is man deciding that he doesn't like the weather. And what, let me ask you this. The root, in fact, I'll just tell you, the root of this is not a love for chocolate. The root of this is the love for money. Because they're not wanting just to save the cocoa bean. They're wanting to increase profits. It's what they're wanting to do. It's what's behind this. And when, anyway, so they're going to they're gonna say, we don't like this weather situation. And this poor cocoa bean is suffering 
we can alter its genetic sequence and we can rebuild it in our fashion so that it is different now than what it started out with when God created it, when God wrote out the cocoa beans genetic book, man says it's not good enough, there's errors in it, we're going to change it to suit us. And folks, this is what happens when people get a hold of a Bible nowadays. They don't like what it says, so they re say we're going to rewrite it so that it suits us and it says what we want it to say. And you wouldn't believe right now the number of new Bibles that are coming out and they're custom designed to fit everybody's little particular doctrines. Whereas a hundred years ago, all the different denominations had one Bible that they read from. Now, every, every little denominational and every little uh, schism doesn't like how the Bible says something because it conflicts with their doctrine. So let's just issue a translation of the Bible where the Bible says what we want it to say so that it matches our doctrine. The Holman Christian Standard Bible is exactly that. It is the Southern Baptist own Bible. They own it and they retranslated it to match their doctrinal statements. Okay, instead of just sticking with one Bible, they've got their own Bible now that matches whatever particular doctrinal difference they have with everybody else. They have a Bible that establishes that. The Jehovah's Witness did it, the Roman Catholics do it, the Southern Baptists do it, everybody else does it, and this is what's happening. So we don't like the cocoa bean because it can't produce the profits that we want, so we're going to rewrite the cocoa bean. And if you say that's, that's something silly, Pastor Mike, that's no big deal to us, what does that have to do with our faith and preaching the gospel? It has everything to do with it. Because they're, re, they're starting to rewriting God's book. And when they get, start get to the humans, and they already don't like what's in the human's DNA, they're going to start selling the idea that we can rewrite the DNA, and we can make it better. We can make man perfect. We can promise you liberty. Okay? But look at what it says. For when they, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. Who do they serve? They serve an unclean spirit, a corrupt spirit, for whom... For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is he brought in bondage. Verse 20. For if after they es they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They know about Jesus. They are again entangled therein. And overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Okay, and so then look at what it says. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I have seen in my life, Chris and Helen and, and, and Lynn, you've seen this too. In our lifetime, we've seen a whole generation of children raised in church only to, once they hit a certain time in their life, they're gone. Church is the last thing on their mind. The gospel is the last thing on their mind. And chances are they may never come back again. I grew up with a whole group of kids in this church that a lot of them, a lot of them are not serving the Lord now. And that's not a boast on my part because I could have been right along with them. When I picked a seat in this church, Caleb J. already listened to this. When I picked a seat in this church when I was your age, I did not pick the best people to sit by. I picked the worst. I picked the ones that I knew we could have a good time during church and we could cut up and laugh and chew our gum and read comic books and all kinds of stuff during church. 
I got a whipping for it, but that's who I chose. Okay? So I could have been, I don't know how I didn't, other than the grace of God. But I could have I, just as easily turned out the way that a lot of my church mates growing up have turned out. I could just as easily have turned out that way. So I'm not, I'm not boasting in any way. Okay? It's God pulled me out is what he did. But I've seen it. I've seen it with my eyes. I see it in scripture. I've seen it in this church. I've seen people come in. Sit for a while, out the door they go, and it's worse, you can see it, it's worse with them than it ever was, than it ever was. You can go up and down and, and start talking to people and ask them, did you go to church as a child? Yes. Do you go to church now? No. And their life, they have no use for church, they have no use for the gospel, they have no use for any of it. Okay? And I, I don't know what happened to them, but things happen. I know sometimes maybe it's the church's fault. Sometimes it's their fault. But it happens. Okay? And I'm just saying to you, unclean spirits love to have a house to dwell in. And just because you got rid of them one day, be on guard. They will want to come back. When you dig up weeds out of your garden one day, are you done? What happens, Chris? They want to come back usually more than there was to start with. And that's how it works. Okay? So, and, and, and he said uh, in Matthew 12, Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And I can tell you there is a wicked generation in America that is exactly this way. They grew up in a different time learning morals, learning the Ten Commandments, learning about God, learning about Jesus, learning about the Bible. But then they've grown up and they've departed from those things. And it'll be a miracle from God if some of them do come back. That's the beauty of it. We don't know who it is out there that's still yet to come back. I believe there's some that's waiting to come back. Amen? Okay? I came back. But I'm just telling you, there's a lot of people out there now. The latter end is worse with them than it ever was at the beginning. Turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 6. This fits here. Okay? While they promised him liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he is brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. When you look at Hebrews chapter 6, look at um, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again, under, by the way, that is the same phrase that you find in 2 Thessalonians 2, a falling away. There shall come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now look at verse 7, because it tie, ties in with this and it explains it to you. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, it bringeth forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Now take that, and let's go to uh, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. By the way, I am not saying... That those who are truly born again, those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying that they become unsaved or unsealed. Salvation means, the definition of the word means that it worked. If we, that day that J.R. was bobbing up and down in the pool, we dove in to pull him out. Did it work? He's sitting here. We saved him, okay? If it didn't work, we wouldn't say, well, we saved him, but he died. We wouldn't say that. 
We wouldn't say, well, we, we rescued him and we saved him, but he died. Okay? That's not salvation. Salvation is it worked. But there's a lot of people who taste, nibble, they, they make a pretense of being saved. But look at, and Mark 4 nails it. Um, verse 14, the sower soweth the word, so the word of God goes to them. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, which, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So these are the people that don't give a hoot about your church or your gospel tracts or your revival meetings or your, your DVDs that you're handing out. They don't give a, a care in the world about these things. They just throw them in the trash as soon as they get them. Verse 16, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. Okay, that's the tasters of the heavenly gift. But, and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time but afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. It's for the word's sake. They get to a place where they, they believe John 3.16, but when you try to tell them that Noah's Ark was real, oh, I don't believe that. When you try to tell them that God created the universe in six days, 6,000 years ago, I don't believe that either. You try to tell them Moses crossed the Red Sea, well, that was a, that was a swamp that they walked through. They don't believe that either. You start telling them that their sin is wrong and they say, well, I don't believe that way. They've got a stony ground. They have, they have no root in themselves whatsoever. And the moment anything bad happens, they're gone. They're out and they're never coming back. And it's worse with them than it was in the beginning. And then verse 18, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. So they never, never worked through these issues in their life. They never took the Bible and used it as a hoe to hoe out the thorns. Because when you get rid of them one day, they're going to grow back. They're going to come back worse. And you got to go out there and work at it again. And it says they have, they fell among thorns and thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no fruit. Choked the word out. The word has no effect in their life whatsoever. And I've seen that one too. And then verse 8, here's the saved people. The saved, born again, sealed by the Holy Ghost, and other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30 and some 60 and some 100. Those are your saved people. Those are the people that once the, un once, like Mary Magdalene, once the seven devils were gone, you can, you can just imagine those seven devils treated her bad. She was probably a mess in her life when those unclean spirits were in her. And when Jesus cast them out, she saw the resurrection and she said within herself, there is no way in the world I want to go back to that. No way in the world. Because if I go back, it'll be worse than it ever was. Can I hear you say amen? See what I'm telling you to do? Keep struggling. Keep pulling thorns up. Keep fighting. Keep taking the, the sword of the word of God and beating it into a plowshare and plow up some fallow ground, some stony areas of life where the roots can, can get in deep. That way, when it doesn't rain for a while, you'll survive. Because you're going to have times where you're not going to be as spiritual as you are today. You're not going to pray as much. You're not going to read the Bible as much. You're going to have those days you will survive it. It's because you allowed God to put in you some deep, deep roots and you're tapping into that water that's way down in there. You know some deep things from the Word of God. Amen? Church is right. I know the bell rang, but I need to hurry. Churches right now are so insistent on keeping it shallow for their people. They have no knowledge of the Word of God. If you know, if you know two things out of your Bible, you tell God, thank you that you know them. Amen. Because God put them there and God's trying to just drill some deep holes for you so you can have some root in you so you'll survive. Amen. Father in heaven, bless your word. Lord, Father, give us a desire in our hearts. Lord, to, I don't want to go back. 
I don't want to be like I used to be. I don't want those devils around. I don't want the filth. I don't want the uncleanness. I don't want the lifestyle. Lord, I come out and that's how it is. And I don't want anything else but to be out for you and for your kingdom. So Father, just nail this down in somebody's heart today. Lord, I know I've touched on this before, but God, just drill it through in their minds. Let it, let it pierce their heart. Let it, let it grow in deep into them, Father, and it'll sustain them. It'll help them, Lord. Help us, dear God, when we start having those yearnings. And we hear those devils saying, come on back. It'll be better than it ever was. Help us to understand, Lord, that what that means is it's going to be worse than it ever was. Father, hear us when we pray. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.